Oh, so, you know, I think what we should do first to exploit the awkwardness of all the delay is we should all sing the theme song together. <laughs> no, don't give any pitches to anybody. Let's see if we, let's see what keys we start in. <laughs> Are you going to give us a downbeat or? Let's just give do it. Down. Let's just get <laughs> together and feel it and do <laughs> Hi everybody, we're Michael and friends here. Today we're going to discuss media in 1986 <laughs> while being socially distant. We broke media in 86 into different categories, just like the 85 video, and we're going to start with books. Question. Yes. What if you don't read? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do the, uh, you yeah, what up, I'm Zach, I'm 19 and I can't read. I will admit that I have not really read any book in my life, but these books in particular I've avoided. There were a lot of books that came out this year that became pop culture phenomenon movies later. 1986 is when Part of the Jason Bourne series came out. It's when Forrest Gump came out in its original novel form, which I didn't even realize it had an original novel. I thought the movie itself was original. God, imagine reading Forrest Gump as a book. I can't. Um, I don't even know what that would look like. You know, Mama such always a said life was like a box of chocolates. And it just says Jenny instead of Jenna. You guys are making fun of my favorite movie of all time, and I will not have it. It's just, it's like so all over the place. I, I think it would be hard to, um, but I guess lots of books are like that. Yeah. I don't read. <laughs> you can make the words as big as you want. I still can't read. <laughs> <laughs> How many other not reading jokes can we put in here? <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't talk about the most important one though. Well, the Babysitter's Club. Michael and Ramin, have you read any of the Babysitter's Club? I can't imagine you did. So I'll ask you, Erica, in the, you know, are you a Carrie or a Samantha kind of way, like, which one are you? You know, I related to, it's, it's actually like Sex in the City, I related to a lot of them on various levels. I think I'm a Claudia. Was she an artsy fartsy one? Yes, but I'm yeah. also a Marianne, so I'm a little both ends of the spectrum because I can be artsy fartsy and social and keep things going, but I also retreat into my sort of bookish yeah. self sometimes. I think um, I want to be a Claudia, but I think she's too cool for me. What was the one that, was it Christy? Christy, Christy was the leader. And, yeah, and I little, think I'm kind of her. Yeah, you're, you're Christy. Or you might be Stacy too. I'm a, is Stacy a diabetic? <laughs> yeah, but she's a, she was the fashion forward one from Connecticut. Well, I don't know about you, Ramin, but I'm a little bit country. <laughs> <laughs> so I, this actually reminds me of something I was gonna talk about later. Everyone, I think, in a lot of series, but especially these kind of series that are about, like, a lot of friends who are sort of on equal footing in the narrative, um, everyone has one person they wish they were and yeah. one person they actually they are. Actually are, like, yeah. I wish I was Blanche, and I always joke with my friends that I am, but I'm Rose. I'm totally... Yeah, I think I'm Rose also. <laughs> I, I wish I was Dorothy, but I'm Rose. I'm more like Dorothy, I think. I, I think I actually am Dorothy. Yeah, you might be Dorothy. Yeah. Yeah. Erica, I think you're also Rose. <laughs> really? Yeah, sorry. You're a sweet summer child. <laughs> I don't have any problem with that, but you know, I would love to, what's the little one's name? The, the old, Ma. Sophia. Yeah. Sophia. That's the one that I was like, I would like to be her. Let's move on to something that some of us know a little bit more about, to movies. <laughs> It's a movie that I've actually seen all the way through, and it's just so bro -y, and it's still such a, like, bro touchstone now. <laughs> so I, when I was really, really little, I had this cousin that was, like, the same age as me. He was really into it. Like, I remember him being really into it. He'd be like, I'm Top Gun. <laughs> right? Like, like doing that, like, I'm flying an airplane. And, um, yeah, he grew up to be the worst kind of bro. It's like... Baby Bro Starter Pack. Well, I've never watched it, actually. Like, I, and I don't care to. Sometimes there's a movie that some culture or subculture of people adopt that's still worth seeing for everyone. I don't know if Top Gun is one of them. What was the song from that movie? Something, Danger Zone. Something, Danger, Danger Zone. zone. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is the word? 
something something danger zone. <laughs> We call this a knife. This is a knife. That was a little bit more like, like Dickensian Cockney. You call yeah. the, the a knife. You call you call that a the a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. <laughs> we'll throw a little Swiss in there. That's fine. <laughs> You're turning into that. What's the, what's the little shrimp guy on the Muppets? I might just do a supercut of Molly attempting accents. <laughs> I've always been like culturally aware of Karate Kid, but I've never, I don't think I've ever actually seen but any. this is part two. Karate yeah. Kid is a classic. I didn't know Karate Kid part two existed. Neither yeah, did I think they did three. It was the fourth highest grossing film in 1986. Good but nobody remembers it because it must not have been that good. I'm guessing not. Yeah, because that body kit is good. Yeah, yeah, the whole wax on, wax off thing it started yeah. with the first one, right? And the, yeah. Like, yeah, and like that's what everybody remembers Karate Kid for. Yeah, and it's sort of like what Ramin, Erica, and I talked about in an earlier video with sequels. Sometimes you just do a thing to make more money with the same property, and mm -hmm. it works. <laughs> Most of the time. This is one where they actually traveled back in time to modern day earth meaning the 19 I, I think it might have been the 1970s it might have been a little earlier than you know that actual year but i could be wrong about that but this is the one if you've ever seen a segment of star trek that had a whale in it yeah it's from this movie yeah they have to they have to take a whale into outer space basically to communicate with an alien that, that is the like, closest going with the alien. and of course yeah and of course you know kirk, kirk being kirk falls in love with someone from 1986 <laughs> not supposed to know that he's there. It's the mom from Seventh Heaven, Bob says. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's absolutely right. Hey, somebody ask me my thoughts about this movie. What are your thoughts? It's never Star Trek. This is one of those movie series that I have such respect for, but I've never actually seen. Yeah, I never have seen here. it either. I'm, it's supposed to be like, like this great like feminist icon, but I... Um, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared too. <laughs> you guys, it's from 1986. The graphics are not going to be anywhere near graphic enough to scare you. Sometimes practical special effects can be way scarier than CGI. So, like, the question is, is it high quality practical effects or, like, really cheesy B-movie practical effects? Is it Gremlins? <laughs> or is it, I don't know, Jurassic Park? <laughs> Yay! Oh, classic. There's a lot I like and dislike about it. There's a lot of like extremely patriarchal things in Ferris Bueller's Stay Off, but uh, there's a lot of great performances in that movie too. But also like it really captures that feeling of a teenager of being trapped in a small town or, or whatever, wanting to break out of the box that society is trying to put you in. People talk about what a fun movie it is and the parade scene and the principal chasing the death and the, you know, Bueller, Bueller, like, and all that stuff. But like, what really that movie is about is I'm not gonna just fall into your expectations just because they're your expectations of me. Stand By Me is like another bro feelings movie. I, I know nothing about it. I don't either, but isn't it, it's about like young boys going camping or something. There are a lot of movies from the 80s and 90s that I've, if anything, seen once and don't really remember, and I, I get them all mixed up. Like, Stand By Me and Lost Boys, and for whatever reason, My Girl is thrown in there. Yes, because yes, they're both I, songs, Stand By Me and My Girl. No, I get them mixed up because they're both songs. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but they're also all like blonde kids with problems, and yeah. like, there's a weird romantic feeling. <laughs> I also, looking at this list, um, I mean, and a lot of the movies in general, the media in general we've seen so far, but especially this top three or four, feels super white to me. I it was just going like, to say that. Like Top Gun, Stay By, Ferris Bueller's Day Off is mega white. Though there were films made by and for people of color at this time, they weren't getting the big blockbuster treatment, they weren't getting the budget. Like, how much good culture did we miss out on because of that? <laughs> Something else to take note of is, like, right now there's a big sentiment in our country of, well, racism's over. You know, a lot of people feel that way, I think. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the 80s might be included in the bracket of time in which a lot of people have thought that. Like, I feel like people... Oh, yeah. a lot of people Basically people, anything after Martin Luther King. Yeah. But then when you look at a list like this, it's so, like, it, it's kind of glaring. 
there were people who were undoubtedly trying to make art but were not getting the green lights. So to say that the art of, of the 80s was white, it's like, yeah, of course it was. And we, we don't know if there could have been other great filmmakers in the 80s who were still doing things that just didn't get the budget that filmmakers of all of these films did or didn't get the publicity or anything like that. Well, and come to think of it, was, was the color purple on the list? That was 85. So that was the year before. So it's like, it's like you get one last year, but this year you don't get one. We'll give you an award so that we can pat ourselves on the back for giving you an award for it. Yeah. And go back to the status quo. Staying on the topic of racism. You know, I was at the Alamo not long ago. They play a bunch of classic movies and they were showing a trailer for Big Trouble in Little China, which is a movie I've never seen. But I was like, are they, can they show this movie? Like, this is incredibly racist yeah. just watching the trailer I, I was astonished yeah. that they would you know and people some people think of it as like a b-movie classic um, it has kim cattrall in it i was watching this trailer and i was really uncomfortable i couldn't believe they were showing it at something like the alamo draft house that's part of the reason some Disney movies have withstood the test of time. Like, you go back and look at some of the old classics, not like Cinderella and Snow White. They have sexist fairy tales behind them, but those have been around for ages. But things like The Jungle Book or The Rescuers, you know, some of those old Disney movies that were all just photocopies of each other. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of sexism. Labyrinth, starring David Bowie's codpiece. <laughs> <laughs> So I did not, was not like a child when I first saw that movie, and I like, it wasn't bad, but I feel like I don't get out of it what the people who are a certain age get out of it. I saw it for the first time in college, um, and I was, what's the word I'm looking for? Astonished by David Bowie's penis. Uh, he did. He danced the magic dance, and uh, <laughs> I think that movie is is charming and weird and delightful. I, your, your resident lover of British costume dramas, adores A Room with a View. It's got parasols. It's got a very young Helena Bonham Carter. It's got Maggie Smith. Put it on your rainy day agenda. I, am I the only one that likes to watch British costume dramas on rainy days? You know what, Molly, now that I know that it's got your endorsement, I should go back and watch A Room with a View because I love those costume dramas it's too. Lovely. Like Sense and Sensibility is one of my favorite sick day movies, but I didn't realize The Room with a View had Judy Dench or Helena Bonham Carter yeah. in it. Uh, I love that movie. As a fellow, hey, Jesus, you're interrupting my monologue. <laughs> as a fellow Molly, I have a certain appreciation for the oeuvre of Molly Ringwald. And it is my belief that Pretty in Pink is her best movie. It is my favorite John Hughes movie. Um, and, and the scene with Ducky, where he's doing the um, Otis Redding thing, iconic. Go on YouTube, look up Pretty in Pink, Otis Redding, Tenderness, and just watch it. It's my, it's, it's, it's so, it's so fun. And that movie also, you know, it, it does that whole thing with like the sort of teenage ennui. The Molly Ringwald character in that movie is so cool. She makes her own clothes and like she does it because she's too poor to like be able to have the cool high shoulder padded blazers as all the rich kids in her school. But she makes her prom dress. I'm sorry. Okay. I just, I love, I just love this movie. Me. I, she has nothing coherent, but I love that movie. I go all those sentiments. I love that movie. Um, I think, I also think it's her best performance. My thought about this one, does anyone have any memories where there are like several senses connected to each other? Because this movie, whenever I think about this movie, I think of a certain smell of dust and plastic. I have that too. And, and with certain of those movies, and I think it has to do with going into the little sort of basement playroom at my grandma's house where there was a TV and a pile of VHS tapes and pulling a tape out and putting it into play. And it's like, it's that dust and plastic. I mean, I feel like that's the smell of a VHS tape, right? Mm -hmm. That has been sitting there for, you know, however weeks since the last time you were at your grandma's house. So my clever repartee about the senses I detect with this movie are, um, it just reminds me of all those dollar store like VHS discount bins where they just put all the shit they didn't have in the room or on the shelf. Did yeah. you have, like, four of them for eight bucks or something ridiculous? By the way, Michael, whenever your head goes back like this, you go headless. 
<laughs> like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he becomes the mirror. <laughs> You guys have to watch this movie. That movie is high camp. Just high camp. You have a young Jeff Goldblum becoming a man who literally turns into a fly slowly over the course of the movie. It has, again, cheesy practical effects. This movie is bananas. <laughs> It's got everything. Yes! It's young Jeff Goldblum. It's got Gina Davis. <laughs> Heard y'all like feelings. Even though I know how very far apart we are, it helps to think we might be wishing on the same bright star. <laughs> I just really remember relating to Five Law on a level because my dad is an immigrant and like having a parent with an accent and like a weird name. But I love the both of the movies. Fun fact about me, I was once the backup singers, the Motown singers in a shadow casting of it, where I um, wore two layers of leggings in order to not have to shave my legs, and it was <laughs> fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> but it was fun. Anyway, I love that movie. Well, I think that's it for movies. We can move on to TV now. The Disney Channel started 24-hour programming in 86. Does anybody else remember having these free preview weekends for the Disney Channel where they would suddenly start showing everything and yeah. their regular lineup and they would put all the good movies on? I lived for those. <gasps> it's a Disney free preview weekend. That was like well into the 90s that they did that and it just made my childhood enjoyable. I would have never been able to watch the Gummy Bears without it. I remember starting to think that at the beginning of those weekends and then by like the second hour in, I was like, this is it. Right. I'm just trying to get comfortable. Get, get some books. I don't read. We already discussed <laughs> Oprah went national. Oh, iconic. She was, you know, this like journalist who had this like startup talk show. And think of her now. She's like a cultural presence. <gasps> okay, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Who used to wake up everybody in their house? on Saturday morning when Pee Wee would say the magic word and you were supposed to scream real loud. <laughs> Absolutely. No? Really, boys? Boys are meant to be silent. If you revisit Pee Wee's Playhouse, it holds up. That it does. was good. And it had all these high caliber like actors and stuff making guest mm -hmm. appearances on it. I mean, it was wacky as shit, but... It was so bananas, but it yeah. was so fun. And I feel like 80s children's programming was all about, like, just being really weird and zany. Yeah, but he was primarily responsible for putting that whole creative concept... Like, he wasn't just on the show. He was creating the show. And you, you can tell that, you know, despite any movie theater incidents later in his life, he had a really good creative vision for everything that he wanted to put into that show. And, and it all just really came together really well. Even though I never watched any of it, the one thing that I do watch every Christmas season is Grace Jones singing Little Drummer Boy on Pee Wee because it's just mm -hmm. so bizarre and amazing. <laughs> God bless Grace Jones. Oh, oh. who we went out? Alf is like that Nick at Night show that they waited until like 10.30 or 11 when my, many people were in bed to show, but they always showed it. I don't even remember, like, what was the concept of it. it was like these people were living with an alien in their house like an aardvark alien yeah aardvalian alien yeah, he, like eat weird stuff too and that was like half the jokes of the show was him eating like things weird. my favorite thing about that show is that apparently the finale i forget what it was they ran out of budget or something right they, they canceled it before the finale could actually resolve <laughs> so the final episode of Alf is a bunch of horrible messed up things happening to everybody that then <laughs> don't don't resolve yeah. <laughs> I know so many people who love that show. Imagine so loving Elf. So when it is a great show. I feel like it is written off in like a lot of the like culturally regarded iconic series as not being as iconic or as recognized because I feel it's a largely female cast. There are so many great one-liners in that show and characters in that show. It reminds me of in a lot of ways of like a West Wing, in the, that it's one of those shows that's being just quoted all over the place. And I think for good reason. I think it's a good sitcom. <gasps> I love that show so much. 
Mark Summer. Everybody's favorite germaphobe. I feel like Double Dare was like the quintessential early Nickelodeon show. When the network first sort of started, it was like they had the slime, they had Mark Summer, and the, like wasn't, wasn't the giant nose where you had to like pick the nose? To that was one of the challenges, yeah. Oh. I feel like Nickelodeon, especially in the early days, was all about like just being as obnoxious and yeah. disgusting and vile as possible. And I feel like that's kind of one thing that caused it to be such a market sensation with kids is it felt like, ooh, I'm being naughty. Like my parents wouldn't let me watch Nickelodeon sometimes. Sometimes they were like, turn that off. Or they were like, you're not watching that for a while. <laughs> but, but that was yeah, sort of the thrill of it, right? Okay, now we can move on to music. Oh. Okay, I've already talked for like half an hour about how much I love Graceland, so. A couple times in a row because the video kept on cutting. <laughs> the Smiths, The Queen is Dead. Oh. Which is a good album. Yeah, it really is. It holds up. As much as I hate Morrissey. Run DMC, Raising Hell. Oh, yes. My Adidas. <laughs> and Walk This Way. Walk This Way is interesting to me because, you know, people talk about it as this great crossover track, but... If you spend any time learning about early hip hop and how they were building beats back then, they were listening to everything because they would have built a beat out of anything. But Walk This Way is unique because they did that kind of like collaboration with Aerosmith. And so it was like these two things that were so divided, rock and hip hop, they sort of came together in this sort of holy union and I think paved the way for a lot more blurring of the lines between the two genres, you know, later on. Beastie Boys, License to Ill. It is frustrating to me that I know so much more about License to Ill than I do about Run DMC. And I've had to sort of go back retroactively and learn about Run DMC. And I think it is very much a race issue. It's interesting to me that if you listen to License to Ill, it is absolutely a hip hop album. But that album, as long as I can remember, or the tracks from it, the singles from it, got played on rock radio, which was a white universe. And so you treated it like rock music and people who liked rock music listened to the Beastie Boys and gave them credence. Whereas they would say, oh, I'm not into rap. I'm not into hip hop. And it's just interesting to me that they got the respect where these other artists that were just as good, if not better, almost certainly better because they created this genre of music, were not getting that attention from white audiences. Distinctions like that are still a thing now, but now it's more along the lines of artists who get called R&B versus artists who get called pop, when really there's very little difference between many of these yeah. artists. And it's, is the artist black? Then it's R&B. Is the artist white? Then it's pop. But all that to License to Ill, such a good album. It absolutely holds up. I know that some of their more sexist tracks, like Girls, they stopped playing over the years because they realized that they were you know, inappropriate. But the song is still kind of fun. I'm sorry. It just is. <laughs> Can I say about Metallica, I'm a person who doesn't enjoy listening to heavy metal music, but I feel like I can appreciate it. And recently, my husband was listening, he's always been into Metallica, and a couple of Metallica songs came on when we were like in the car or whatever, and I was like, you know what? This music is fantastic. It's incredibly sophisticated. It's exquisitely, like, virtuosically performed. It's good. I don't enjoy listening to it, but it is objectively good. I sort of feel similarly, something that I can say is uh, that I think is objectively good, but it comes down to like, I don't really like guitar solos that much. In the same way that I don't really like extensive solos on any instrument that much. And I don't like bel canto that much. So I, I think you're really exceptional in that way. I think all people, like the reason the guitar solos exist is because people get down with them. I don't like performance for the sake of just showing off. Yeah. That way Metallica is like a bel canto opera. In this essay, I will. I agree with Michael that I feel like a lot of times performance is celebrated to the extent where the actual structure of the music is overlooked or uh, perhaps misunderstood even because uh, performers are so good at what they do that they can mold things that uh, may otherwise be at a base level kind of mediocre and bring them into fabulousness. Peter Gabriel, so, and that actually has some great songs on it. Mm -hmm. it that has Sledgehammer, it has mm -hmm. In Your Eyes, which is like the quintessential father-daughter dance song, <laughs> except for the, for the fact- I thought that My Girl was the quintessential 
quintessential father daughter dance song. And the, the problem with In Your Eyes is it's not a great song to dance to, and it's like 12 minutes long. I always thought the quintessential father daughter dance song was Butterfly Kisses, and that's not very good to dance to either. Oh. The other one I was going to say was Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder. That's yeah. So, so My Girl and Isn't She Lovely are fun to dance to. Janet Jackson Control. She's one of my patron divas, especially for this album. The highest grossing album of 86, Madonna's True Blue. Well, I have thoughts about this album because I listened to the whole thing. She's probably one of the artists whose discography I've listened to more than most others. A kind of sewer, a kind of sewer of Madonna albums. This holds up. This is a good Madonna album. I mean, it's not Like a Prayer, which is my favorite. It's not Ray of Light, but there's some bops on this album. Yeah, yeah, Pop It On Preach is a great song. Yeah. I love Pop It On Preach. Uh, Open Your Heart is on this album. I love that oh, song. Right. Yeah. When I went through that album to pick songs for my playlist, I didn't realize how many of her good songs that I really like are on it. Cindy Lauper's True Colors. I love that Cindy Lauper yeah. song. Yeah. But the, like the whole album, I don't know. I only know that song. <laughs> Billboard's top singles of 86. Not all of these were necessarily released in 86, but these are the ones that were played the most in 86. That's what friends are for, Dion and friends. Oh, friends. I'm pretty sure in like kindergarten, I was forced to do like a performance for parents of that song that had like <laughs> hand motions. Like, um, I have a vague memory of that happening. This is weirdly the year, if you look at all these songs on this particular list together, this is the year of like the big sappy, Beach ballad synth jam. On my own, Patti LaBelle and Michael McDonald. Broken Wings, Mr. Mister. There's definitely a trend happening here. There's definitely a trend. It's darker, but you know, it's like <laughs> the beach, but you've had a few too many cocktails and you know, a little sunburnt and, and pissed. Breaking this pattern, How Will I Know, Whitney Houston. I have the album that How Will I Know is from on vinyl and I have to say, being able to listen to it in vinyl, you can hear like every little undertone in her voice and, and also like in the instrumentation a little bit too, but, but mostly in her singing that you don't get in other formats. And I don't know, mm -hmm. it's, it's always a treat to listen to. I've always thought that like most of the time when I'm listening to vinyl, I don't hear a huge difference. But when I've been at Molly's and she's played me opera on vinyl, yeah. it makes a big difference because it catches well the warmth and richness of voices so much better, I think. Well, you know why? There's a sound compression that has been happening with making music go digital over the years. And what they've been doing is taking all the natural nuance of bass and the various levels of sound projections and sort of crunch them down so that they are more even. Because when you get these vinyl recordings, you can hear that one voice or one element of it is quieter than another, but in the digital format, that doesn't work as well. So they kind of level those out a little bit. They add more bass to it. And it takes away a lot of the depth and richness that we get from old vinyl and cassette recordings, as opposed to digital where everything's just kind of blaring in your ears a little bit. I've listened to multiple podcasts on this. It's a really fascinating progression to watch us go from vinyl to you know mp3s and i think it speaks to just how extraordinary whitney houston singing is because when i listen to vinyl it's primarily opera also because I, again like i feel like with a lot of music you know you can't really hear the, the difference in sound quality but i think whitney houston is singing in such a technical way that it's using overtones the same way that opera singers do and so you can hear all of that when you listen to it on vinyl i haven't listened to whitney on vinyl um Rumi and i want to come over to your house in yeah, houston you're welcome to time you're in houston. That. come on oh. <laughs> just like knock on the door put on the vinyl and i'm like okay bye <laughs> yeah <laughs> i came here for this just for that but it's not actually singing. mr mr kyrie is such a cheesy fun song another beachy ballad I mean, remember that old Michael video where I had really big hair and you were, and we had that playing in the background and you were blowing on my hair? <laughs> <laughs> Pet Shop Boys, West End Girls. It's I love really that song. I'm such a stan for Pet Shop Boys. It's ridiculous. I bought so many of the tracks from their uh, Greatest Hits album on iTunes when I was like in my early 20s and just bopped in DC to it. Anyway, but <laughs> they're also incredibly queer, which I love about them, mm -hmm. especially in the 80s. I weirdly love that song. I don't know why. Like, I associate it with, like, bounce houses and pool parties and just childhood, you know. Chuck E. Cheese. Endorphins. 
Cutting crew, I just died in your arms. That goes back to like the like sad beak synth rock sort of thing again. Let's see. There's so much music stuck in my head after this. But you know what is maybe the best song of 86, Kiss by Prince. Oh! Yeah. Oh my God. All Prince songs. Still talking about Prince, Bangles, Manic Monday. It's a fun song. I don't know if it's a good song. <laughs> Um, you know what I think I realized about Prince writing Manic Monday is that I think it sounds a lot like 1999. It's the same. Okay, that was the Bangles version, and then the yeah. other one was the Prince version. I also noticed that there's a Madonna song on here that not a lot of well, talk about. Sorry, you look like really. <laughs> Live to tell, I feel, is one of those Madonna songs, and also general gay icon songs that are like about being gay without being about being gay. Something that is not subtle, though, and is exactly what it says. It is Janet Jackson's "Nasty." No, which, not subtle at all. Which has possibly my favorite line in all of Janet's discography. Say it, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, my first name ain't Baby. It's Janet. Miss Jackson, if you nasty. Bananarama's song, Venus. Bananarama is a legit good pop band. If yeah. you go back and listen to their tunes in general, there's some, I wouldn't say Venus is, but there are some bops. Crowded House, Don't Dream It's Over. I love that song. I think that song holds up. That's a good song. Yeah. That's one of those songs that everybody knows it when they hear it, but the lyrics and the title is just like, wait, what is that? I think that's a good example of a beach ballad. It's a good beach ballad. Genesis, Tonight, Tonight, Tonight. You know, um, Genesis, I feel like, well, I was going to say underrated, but I guess not. I guess exactly rated as it should be. Yeah. yeah. And Phil Collins, too. He had just the right level of notoriety mm -hmm. with his talent. But as much as we all love to make fun of Phil Collins, he wrote some fun music. <laughs> yeah, he did. I mean, and he you had, a only... very, had a very long career, you know? And you can only make fun of him because he's so good, right? Mm -hmm. You make fun of In the Air Tonight, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's like, and that that, like, the drums coming, but like, you make fun of it because it's iconic. R.E.M. Superman. R.E.M. is a band from Athens, Georgia. Like the B-52s are also a band from Athens, Georgia. And my dad is also from North Georgia and <laughs> is a big music head. And I listened to a lot of R.E.M. in my early years. And I had Superman, like, we talk about songs that we associate with, like, smells in our grandmother's basement and Chuck E. Cheese and like bouncy castles and like I Am Superman is being in the car backseat of this like sort of sweaty hot Volvo driving down Interstate 81 through Knoxville to Rome, Georgia to my dad's hometown in Georgia and I hear my dad and my brother and me all singing along. <laughs> that's what that's what that song is, I Am Superman. That's it for music. So we can move on to video games so Molly can take a nap or something. <laughs> <laughs> Things that were released on NES, many of which were hugely important later, uh, like The Legend of Zelda. If we're talking about favorite series, it might be my number two. Dragon Quest also is pretty significant, although every Dragon Quest game I've personally played has always felt like the same game, but it's an important JRPG. Yeah, and we wouldn't have Final Fantasy without Dragon Quest. Erica and I already discussed Super Mario Brothers: The Lost Levels, the real Mario 2, and how much, and how much I hate it. And Metroid. I would have loved to have been able to like be a, a fly on the wall in every gamer bro's bedroom when they finally beat Metroid for the first time and saw that Samus was a woman and how shocked and appalled they were. When it comes to video game big reveals, that's one of the big ones yes, in all it of it. And beautifully done, too, because if, if it had been a known entity that that was a woman in that costume, that game wouldn't have sold. It mm -hmm. wouldn't be Metroid if yeah. everybody knew that that was a female heroine. It says a lot about culture, but hopefully some people maybe learn something. I doubt it, but maybe. I think for the time, they were doing what they could. It does suck that the game had built into it sort of like, the higher your score, the more of her armor she takes off at the end. So you can see her in like a one piece bathing suit if you do really well. Which is also like, who was getting their jollies to like 150 pixels? You take what you would get at the time. All right, so now just sort of general thoughts about media in 86. Starting with representation and how much of it holds up today. How do we feel about representation, about media in 86 as a whole? 
Well, and we've already talked about it a little bit. I mean, I think I think we can say that things were very white. Uh -huh. Things were very male focused. They were for a male audience, uh, with few exceptions. I think, especially with movies, mm -hmm. in music and video games and books and TV, there's more that was more explicitly for people of color and or for for women or you know any other minorities but i think at this time people were thinking more along the lines of like oh this isn't otherwise just turned down here i think at this point people were thinking like oh movies are where we make the money so that's that's where we'll put all our effort into making some good stuff for white men <laughs> oh no so we were talking about how how it's as bad as you would expect it to be kind of the music different... is a bit of an exception uh, music and video games and TV and books all feel like they're slightly better. Although we don't really know with books because we don't read. I certainly don't. But with TV and video games and music, it feels a little bit better. But I think that it's largely because they weren't taken as seriously as major art forms in 86. So they weren't as aggressively marketing toward only white men because it's like, oh, th these aren't as serious as movies. Oh, see I don't know that that's why. I think with music and video games especially, they were already the domain of non-white people slightly more than other media, right? I always say American popular music was invented by black people. Yes. Right? Like, so, so it makes sense that even though the audience, the target audience oftentimes is white people or you have white artists that are stealing black ideas, and that's just been universally true throughout all of American history, it still feels like it's easier for a person of color to reach the mainstream in music than probably any other art form. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Probably. What about representation of women or LGBTQ plus people? I think that in music, 86 seems a little better, but- Janet Jackson and Madonna. These artists did not disappear in 85. They were just busy creating their next project in 85. Right. But, but it's also, still overwhelmingly male in the music yes. side. Especially yeah. in what people are considering the best, whether they're mm -hmm. professional people considering it the best or what's getting pushed on the radio the most. I feel like maybe there are signs in this list that the trends of better representation that happened in the mid to late 90s are on their way, but they're not there yet. I think we're still not there yet in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've regressed from the late 90s. Yeah, that's something that I'm looking forward to tracing. I think the same thing, but I want to see if it actually like shows up in trends. Yeah. And I think it will. I mean, I've heard people talk about this before. This idea of in the 90s, especially on TV, you had shows like In Living Color, you had Living Ellen. Single, you had all these shows that, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air that were starring majority Black casts. And you don't see that on TV anymore. And when it comes to female representation, female representation in the mid to late 90s was really celebrated in a lot of genres. In things like the Riot Girl movement and mm -hmm. so much music being very like girl power that also plays out in TV shows like Buffy that were mm -hmm. around the same time. And video games like Final Fantasy VI that were around the same time and stuff like that. This all happened at about the same time and then it just went away and everything got very squeaky clean and boring and male and white. 11th. Yep. There's a little bit of just a tiny couple of markers in the television world that we're starting to move toward better representation, but it's the same as like you get a little nugget here and there rather than being like a solid consistent representation like look at our own list the cosby show is top of the nielsen yeah, like designing women golden girls yeah but yeah. you also see some of the underpinnings of that that you know the cosby show was about a black family but it was it was accessible to white people who didn't see that on tv because a lot, they were so a was... wholesome black family right yeah and they By were the more upper middle class they were marketed as such too. Like yeah. it's, a lot of this has to do with marketing as well. Like you see, and then we talk about things like, okay, you had the Golden Girls and Designing Women. You had these shows that were clearly designed for women. You have things that are being steered 
in certain directions and we haven't moved away from that yet. And you see things like Oprah, you're getting nuggets here and there. I'm looking for more consistent, wide ranging representation, which I don't think that we see, especially in the television world. I mean, you have nuggets going back to the sixties. Right, exactly. The nineties is where I think it got most consistently diverse. But that's what I mean when I say that you see the beginnings of it here with stuff like Oprah premiering in 1986, but we're not there yet. Any other thoughts from anybody? I actually do read. Hey, you. Yeah, you. No, not you. Yep, yeah. Yeah, you. Listen, I think the way that you washed your hands when you went to the bathroom was sexy. Signing off. <laughs> Me, so I can go away from me. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is gonna go in because this is really funny. <laughs>